What are the main planks of your new proposal? Well, first off, uh, what we do is we freeze non-defense discretionary spending at the 2008 level, index it for inflation and, and for the next 10 years, and that saves about $450 billion. Uh, then we create a new Joint Committee of the Congress, a permanent standing committee of the Congress, whose sole purpose would be to reduce spending, find ways to reduce the deficit through spending cuts, not through tax increases, but through spending cuts. And, uh, and that they would have to find 10 percent uh, savings of the deficit every budget cycle. So that would be a, a second component. And then finally, we reform the budget process. We make it a biannual pro, uh, budget process as opposed to an annual one. And so that the in the even number years, election years, we're doing oversight and trying to find ways to save money rather than spending money, which is what oftentimes happens in election years today. In an odd numbered year, a non-election year, we would actually do the congressional budget process and uh, it would be for the first time a binding joint resolution signed into law by the president so that you get the buy-in from both the executive and the legislative branches of the government. And, and then of course we reform the, the PAYGO process so that um, revenues that come into the trust funds can't be double counted and can't be used for unrelated spending on other issues. So there are a whole range of uh, budget reforms that we make uh, that we think make sense. It creates a process I think for the first time where we actually can put downward pressure on spending and it seems to me at least today that the problem we have with all the borrowing and all the debt and these massive trillion dollar year over year deficits and now a 13 trillion dollar debt, uh, what we've got to do is we've got to get control of spending here in Washington and reforming the budget process in my view uh, will do more to change the way Washington works and to end business in as usual in Washington than almost anything else that we can do. And a lot of people right now don't put a lot of stock in congressional committees or, or Congress itself. Uh, how can you ensure them that, that cuts will actually be followed through and made? The, the thing I think that we do, we provide teeth in, in, the, in the, uh, the process that we create. For example, the, the cap on discretionary spending, it would take a two-thirds vote of the Congress to override that. The, um, the Deficit Reduction Committee would make a uh, recommendation every year to the Congress that would have to be acted on. It, 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 the, the bill calls for an expedited procedure whereby it would get a vote in the Senate and again it would have to achieve a minimum of 10 percent of the previous year's deficit in terms of savings. So under circumstances right now with a 1.4, 1.5 trillion dollar deficit uh, you, th this deficit uh, reduction committee would have to find about $150 billion minimum in savings. They could go higher than that and that would be guaranteed a vote in the United, on the floor of the United States Senate and in the House of Representatives. So what we've tried to do is tighten this up uh, to put some, uh, some collars around it so that there isn't a lot of room for politicians here in Washington in the House and the Senate to, uh, to get around or get away from uh, the requirement, the responsibility that we have to make sure that we're being good stewards of the people's tax dollars. And a persistent myth on the left is that spending's not the problem, it's things like the 0103 tax cuts. Um, how do conservatives win this argument? Well, first off, the, the, the issue in Washington, in my view, is not a tax issue, it's not a, uh, a revenue issue, it's a spending issue. Uh, spending is out of control, and, uh, and obviously uh, the left is going to argue that the way that you deal with deficits is you raise taxes. Well, the worst thing that you can do in the middle of a recession is to raise taxes on the job creators in our economy, which are our small businesses. So the real issue here is that uh, spending has gotten away from us to the point now where we are running a $1.5 trillion annual deficit where over 40 cents of every dollar that is spent at the federal level is borrowed. So this isn't a tax issue. Uh, we have <laughs> lots of taxes. The American people play, pay plenty of taxes. This is a spending issue and that's where this has to start. There is no justification today for talking about raising taxes on the American people until Washington has gotten serious about getting wasteful spending under control. Why will you be voting no against Elena Kagan's nomination to the Supreme Court? I think Elena Kagan is someone who in the course of her uh, professional career has held mostly uh, partisan political positions. Uh, she's not been a judge. She's not. She's had very little courtroom experience. Not tried cases. She's got a very thin record. What we do know about her is her her jobs in terms of the uh, the, the, the political partisan positions that she's occupied, as well as uh, her role in academia. And having looked at her record, I have concluded that I don't think she can put aside those political partisan positions that she has and act with impartiality when it comes to applying the law and the Constitution. 
Uh, if I had a comfort level about that, it would be different, but I don't. And the reason I don't is there isn't anything in her record that suggests that she possesses that type of impartiality. And absent that, um, I can't be for a nominee to the Supreme Court who I'm not, gonna, I'm not, I'm not convinced is going to be a constitutionalist, is going to be someone who understands that the role of a judge in our American democracy isn't to, uh, to take sides, but is someone who, as John Roberts has described it, calls the balls and strikes, somebody who is an umpire and, uh, and doesn't try and weigh in on one side or the other. And it strikes me that Elena Kagan, in, in, with respect to her uh, career in public service and, and um, politics, very much is someone who will try and take her liberal positions and integrate them into the decisions that she, uh, she votes on and the opinions that are issued by the Supreme Court. Another important issue in the Senate right now in the national security arena is the START Treaty. Uh, what's your current position on this treaty? Well, it's a, it, we're still looking at uh, a number of issues. There are uh, several concerns that I have about the, the START Treaty, at least today. One is uh, the issue of modernization. Are we going to make the necessary investment in modernizing our nuclear stockpile? We have not designed new weapons for 20 years. We haven't tested new weapons for 20 years or tested our weapons for 20 years. And to me, the issue is uh, reliability of our, of our nuclear uh, arsenal. And it strikes me, at least, that uh, the administration to date has not made the necessary commitment toward modernization that would give me a comfort level that uh, that stockpile is, uh, is serviceable and in working order, or at least reliable enough, if needed, uh, to, uh, to do the job. So uh, that's a big issue for me. The issue of missile defense also bears heavily on my view of the START agreement. And uh, obviously there are some questions there with regard to uh, what the treaty says, both in terms of its uh, preamble, uh, inferences in the treaty itself, and clearly the statements that the Russians have made. Uh, but I can't vote for something that I, don't, that I believe inhibits the United States' ability uh, to defend itself uh, from some sort of a nuclear missile attack.